Howdy YouTube and welcome to this episode of The Gunman. So today we're doing the prep and masking on this Volvo XC90. I might include a little bit of color matching as well in this video. So yeah, it's a pretty straightforward job here. We've got a brand new door, uh, door shell for the yeah, left hand front door here. And we've got a couple of blends and then we've got yeah a small sort of repair on the rear door and then a little bit of a spot repair on the front bumper cover there. So it's basically a brand new car this thing. It's actually a job for a car yard so I, I don't know if the car has been sold or not but we do a little bit of car yard work at the workshop that I work in so sometimes just because it's from a car yard doesn't mean that it's not insurance work so they obviously have you know a big insurance uh, policy and for all I know the customer might have even bought this car then taken it back to the dealership and then got their recommended repairer being us to do the job so honestly that's all stuff that doesn't really bother me but yeah it is a car yard job so that's probably the reason that we uh, did spot repair that front bumper cover if you're wondering there so the car yards usually do like to um, save as much money as they can where possible obviously so at the end of the day the front bumper was just a few scuffs there so obviously the job has been primed up already Alan would have primed that up the night before so obviously you saw me starting off by giving all the panels a really good clean down with methylated spirits and water um, that's just like 50 50 mix or thereabouts whatever it's not it doesn't have to be a hundred percent I'm sure you could probably uh, just use uh, straight methylated spirits which is denatured alcohol for my American viewers um, and on the other hand you can just use straight up water I used to do that and it works it gets all the water based contaminants like dirt off obviously and then you might even want to go around the edges if there's like oil based contaminants and yeah just clean it down with some wax and grease remover so there's always options you don't always have to have exactly the same things as I have but you can still get the same results um, doing slightly different methods so anyway got it all cleaned down and next up I'm just giving it a good block down with the 3M uh, relatively long thin block the, I find this block does most of the small size repairs that um, I encounter on a daily basis very well um, if you hang around for another minute I've actually got another curved block which is a very handy little thing for curves like this so um, if I was to try and fit that block into right into that curve then I could run the risk of um, getting lines from the edge of the block that sort of digs into the curve so yeah just using 180 grit at the end of the day the, the uh, sandpaper that I use is dependent on the quality of the repair the amount of primer that's on there um, you know if if I knew that that repair was like nearly perfect I'd probably just go straight up with even 320 maybe even up to 400 just to give it a light block down but I knew that there was some sort of slight ripples in there something that needed to be um, blocked down um, nice and flat so look need be I'll reprime parts if I have to it's, it's not uncommon uh, for a painter to have to do little repairs like small filler repairs and repriming things and it rarely slows us down in the shop that I'm working at the moment it's a funny thing because this shop here we've got four painters and two spray booths and if, if the repair isn't a hundred percent it really doesn't slow us down whereas the previous shop I was in we had one spray booth but there was still four staff in the paint shop but it just seemed to slow us down a hell of a lot more because you'd plan your day out you'd think okay well this is this is the way it's all going to go but then you would encounter a hiccup and it would stop that spray booth whereas here with the two spray booths it really does seem to make a big difference so um yeah it's just different shops are run differently and it's it's funny because on paper you wouldn't think that this shop would do you know twice the amount of work as the other shop but yeah it really does it's uh, I don't know, it's a fine-tuned machine, I think, and I enjoy working at this shop and just smashing the jobs out. I, I get a kick out of um, doing a good quality job like this, you know, like I do like working on new cars. It was actually another thing that I found about the last place I was in. They did too many um, commercial vehicles like vans, utes, and just solid color white, you know, two-pack white. It's just boring stuff that I can't really take a great deal of pride in, whereas, you know, you get yourself a nice brand new Volvo, a job like this it's something that you can I don't know take a bit of pride in I, I personally I like doing this kind of work um, and it's something that I don't usually get I don't usually get the other painters like fighting me for these jobs because they're like nah I'll, I'll, 
I'll just chill on the Mazdas or you know the Toyotas and and you do your prestige work. So yeah, it works out good for me and the other guys. So yeah, it's all good. Um, and up here, I think I was just using 320. As I said before, you know, like um, depending on the quality of the repair, the size of the repair, and all all those you know variations, it will depend on the sandpaper I use. So it's not just like a one size fits all when it comes to sand um, sanding, and that's just something that I guess is going to come with experience. You'll get the hang of what you need to be using. And yeah, next up, got the orbital sander, something that um, you know you, you do have to be careful with, but. Again, I've been using these things for years, and I've, uh, I don't know, I've just got it, got it nailed on how to just keep them moving and keep them flat. Sometimes you do have to edge them up a little bit, like in some of the corners, but then um, to stop you from getting uh, sort of orbital sander marks, maybe you'll go over the top of it by hand just to remove any of those fine um, gouges that you may have put into some of the edges as the parts that you see me sanding now. One thing that I'd always been told since I was like a first year apprentice, I've always liked the saying, um, is uh, a bad tradesman blames his tools. You know, so sometimes you do get people saying, oh no, nah, it was the spray gun, or no, nah, it was the it was the orbital sander, that's why I've got ripples all through my car, you know. No, nah, it's not the orbital sander's fault, it's not the spray gun's fault, it's usually the way you've used them, and, and a good tradesman will be able to identify the fact that hey, even in the case that it is the orbital sander putting ripples into it, um, you would you'd think you'd be able to say, well, hey, before you go and spray it, there's ripples there, and I need to sand this a different way or something like that, you know, or if if your gun is giving you too much orange peel, well, it's usually not the the spray gun's fault. It's probably the way you're using it. And if it is a spray gun's fault, well, that's when a good tradesman will say, I'm not using that. I'm going to be using the tools that I know are going to work for me. So, yeah, as I say, a bad tradesman blames his tools. It's one of those things, like, I heard someone make a comment about everyone, like all these people now, bagging on, like, the older generation of spray guns now that you've got the SATA X5500 now that you've got the Devilbus DB1 out they're like oh the old pro lights they're terrible and you know the old SATAs etc they're terrible they're not good anymore it's like well the paint hasn't changed so I don't see why you should you know need a new gun to do what you were always doing and yeah if you could get good results before with it why can't you now it's not, it's not like the guns change, <laughs> and it's not like the paints change, so... All that aside, continuing on with the prep work, so once I've got the deeper scratches from my block work out, so the uh, 320 and 180 grit sanding scratches out with some 400, I'll then go over all the primer edges. If you run your hand over the rough primer edges, you'll feel, you'll know just by feel that it's not sanded properly. So yeah, just using a combination of obviously look and feel. So yes, your hands and your fingers, they are your second set of eyes when you're doing prep work. Um, and they'll usually be able to identify, yeah, what you can't see, I guess. So always just running your fingers over the edges once you think you've got it done, right? As you can see here. You obviously don't want to have hands that are too greasy or anything when you're doing your prep work. If you've just, if you've just like um, finished removing and refitting parts, like say if you're doing this entire job from start to finish yourself, and maybe you are a panel beater looking at. Uh, trying to learn spray painting you don't want greasy fingerprints from where you've taken the doors off and stuff like that on your freshly prepped panels so yeah maybe just before you start your prep work give your hands a good clean down just to get the oils off a little bit of dust isn't going to be a big deal because the dust is off the car so it's not usually that big of a deal but yeah uh, cleanliness is next to godliness as they say so keep it clean when you're doing your prep work um, blow the, all the dust off in between each stage keep the orbital sander clean as I say keep yourself clean um, yeah all of those little things will hopefully result in a cleaner job for you in the end it's something that um, does save you a bit of time I, I find as well you know the less polishing work you have to do the better nobody likes polishing except for maybe some of those details which always like to tell me I'm doing it wrong uh, although my results are usually satisfactory <laughs> now, I do find it quite bizarre how whenever I upload a video on detailing I'll get like this gang of um, keyboard warriors that have watched some other YouTube videos and 
next thing you know there's some kind of professionals and gods behind the buff or something like that and yeah they think they know better than someone who's uh, basically done this for a, um, a career and has actually learned how to do you know detailing and cutting and polishing and you know got good quality results consistently across the years yet someone who's watched a video on YouTube decides to say no well, you're bad at that you don't know how to do it <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird I mean out of all the videos I've done you know you get very very little negative feedback from your spraying or your prep work or all of that kind of stuff but you polish a car and you better watch out you know because <laughs> those warriors are on their way anyway all that aside um, yeah just buzzing down my blend panel so I do find a lot of the European vehicles have a very thick finish on them so a thick orange peel I don't I don't even think it's a bad look um, probably doesn't it's probably not as easy on the eye as a lot of the Japanese finishes but to me it just means that they put enough clear coat on these are the kind of cards that actually do last a little bit longer especially in the West Aussie Sun we do have a hole in our ozone layer from spraying too many CFCs up into the um, atmosphere and yeah I don't think that uh, is very good for our paint so yeah if, if you've got like West Aussie cars parked in the sun uh, within five years man like a lot of the Japanese cars they just there's no paint left at all um, whereas you know the European cars like your, your Volvos, your Audis, your Volkswagens, BMWs, Mercedes etc they seem to A use a better quality clear and just put a little bit more on which yeah that's a good thing Anyway, the, uh, the reason I was mentioning that is that uh, it takes a little bit longer to sand that orange peel out to get it, like, to get rid of all the shiny spots. So that's why I do use 600 on my blend panels on the orbital sander on a lot of the European vehicles, if not all of the European vehicles with that thick finish in them. However, doing a Japanese or even, you know, American... Uh, car, uh, Australian, etc. A lot of the time I'll go 800 because they just don't put quite as much paint on there and yeah more prone to cutting through uh, a lot quicker so just on all those edges you do have to be careful um, yeah whereas with these yeah, they just got lots of paint on there. And then next up I just obviously gave it a blow down, blow off all that dust and inspect it, make sure I haven't got any stone chips. If I did that would be the opportunity to fill them in, so I'd fill a bit, um, put a bit of two pack knifing punny if there was any stone chips. I'd then go around sanding my edges as you see me now with a bit of 800 first and then I'll go over the edges with some grey scotchy to finish it off. And then usually by the time you've done your edges with your 800 grit and your scotchy, you'll be right to go and sand that two pack knifing putty out and then your prep work will be done. Obviously give it a blow down and inspection first and then yeah, you should be pretty right to go in. Stone chips and scratches are one of those things, depending on the color and depending on where they are. If, if it's sort of safe to fix without ruining your blend, I will always do it. Otherwise, depending, you know, if, if it's like a light metallic like this, and I really want to keep that blend, then sometimes uh, if the chip is too far away from where I'm wanting to put my color, I'll just do a little neat touch up and then clear it over the top of that. And yeah, it's usually enough to, keep me happy and yeah, customers happy as well because it's one of those things we're not here to fix everything there's usually like the, the damaged area and that's what we're getting paid to fix and we can't just uh, fix everything out of the kindness of our hearts because we're not a charity we're, we are at the end of the day a business that's there to make money so yeah it's all good but another thing I do actually like about doing the newer cars is you get less stone chips, you know, there's less chance of having two or three different colours on the car because they're usually, uh, well, a lot of the time they haven't been sprayed three or four times. So sometimes, you know, if this is like a 10 year old vehicle, you might have the quarter panel a different colour from the bonnet or something like that, or the hood as you call in America, you know, and then you may even have to either mix two colours or blend the quarter panel just you know and mask it all up not even get paid for it but just to make the job actually look half decent you know what i mean um yeah that's just part of spray painting but as i say this is another one of those little reasons i do actually like working on newer cars i find the colors do come up a little bit better the, the paint hasn't faded as much little things like that but um yeah it's all good i use the standoff spectrum with photometer to match all of my colors these days and 
I know, I know I should have already known this, but I just never really looked into it, never had the time, I guess, and the truth is it, it barely took more than five minutes to learn how to do, but now I actually know how to formulate my own colours on uh, the standoff system, it really is not hard at all. If enough people um, are interested, I can show you how to do it. It's it's not hard if you got like half a um, computer, uh, you know, literate brain. You, you should be able to figure it out yourself, really. Just go and and yeah. So you can also save um, a spectro reading into the computer. So this color here, from memory, ooh, I can't even tell from this little viewing window I've got in my video editor but from memory it needed like a drop of 576 was which is like the magenta -y color um, yeah as I say like I, I sprayed this job around a month ago now so it's uh, not 100% fresh in my mind exactly what I had to do to match this color but so yeah these days I always spray a bit of um, uncatalyzed clear so just clear coat without the hardener in it over my color cards I never used to do it, it's a funny thing, but yeah, I just started doing it and it does change the colour a little bit and it makes me think, how the hell did I get away with it for all those years, matching colours edge to edge without it, but either way, it used to work and I just find this this way works a little bit better, so yeah, as it turns out, no, it, it was too magenta, that's right, so it was a little bit too on the red side, so, so I'm using a bit of blue and yellow together to make it go green, that's what I usually do, so if I've got a colour that is too red, um, rather than putting green in, I find that blue and yellow together, you can control the tone of green um, a lot more by mixing the yeah blue and yellow together. So essentially, yeah, yellow and blue does make green. Um, so you might say, why don't you just put green in? No, I, I always, I rarely put a green tinter into a, a color that, that needs green, if that makes sense. So yeah, at the end of the day, each of their own, you might have a completely different way of color matching. As long as you, you get your colors acceptable and out the door, that that's fine. But yeah, even the guys that I work with that are pretty experienced have got pretty similar methods to me. And it's one of those things, color matching, you know, you can always pick up new tricks off someone else. So um, I've never been above asking a question, you know, I might get a color, say 95%, or I might even think the color's 100 or 95% blendable, and I'll get, get a second opinion off my mate, and he's like, yeah, I don't know, man, I'll put a bit of blue in there, or I'll put a bit of um, gold pearl in there, or whatever it be, but again it's just one of those things that you'll never be able to like learn color matching off a youtube video I, I don't think anyway i mean you might be able to get some great pointers but you you really it's one of those things you just got to get in there and do yourself and mess it up and then learn how to fix it up so i think i mentioned it a few times in the past like when i went to trade school that's what i really focused on because i've got a lot of time um as an apprentice to learn how to do um prep work and a bit of spraying work as well but I'd never really got a lot of opportunity to do the color matching because, you know, possibly ruining a lot of money's worth of paint. So they, I just didn't get the opportunity. Um, so that's why I just, yeah, went hard on the color matching at trade school and something that I, I think I'm pretty good at now. I mean, I'm not perfect, but it, it's a very important uh, step of um, spray painting. It's one of those things that you don't even need to be a spray painter. You don't need to be in the trade to see a bad color match. You know what I mean? Like it's something that's just going to stand out as a bad job with no knowledge of the trade. Whereas there's other things that you know you pro you may not see unless you know what you're looking for. Uh, even you know a little bit of a run on a door handle, you may not even see that because you might not be looking there. You might not see a little bit of orange, excessive orange peel or dry orange peel, whatever that be, but you know, you really, like if the color's really bad, it's something that anyone can see. Anyway, all that aside, I got the color to a point that I was happy with and then, yeah, got the car all blown down, put it into the booth and we're doing the masking stage now. So one thing I've been doing a lot of lately is uh, getting the edge masking done throwing the plastic over the car and then I'll do my seal or, or the wet on wet primer on if I've got any wet on wet primer work to do but I did on this one because we've got the brand new door so the brand new door comes in black e-coat which you really shouldn't paint over because you're not going to get adhesion the paint's just uh, your base coat's really just not going to stick to it so you do need to get some sort of a primer over the top of the um, brand new panels 
Um, and yeah, in this case, it's just a, a wet on wet, non-sanding primer, aka sealer in the USA. Um, but yeah, like uh, I'll, I'll put that on and then while that's drying, I'll finish off the rest of the masking. So yeah, look, I, d I don't f think there's much I can say about masking. I do have lots of videos on my raw channel where I go right through from start to finish. You know, some of the jobs might even go for 30, 40 minutes of worth of masking, but um, I, I, I do have a chat and talk about shoot the breeze with you guys on my raw channel but on my main channel i just edit the videos down quite a lot because yeah i sort of run out of stuff to say about masking it's one of those things that i know some people do struggle with so that's why i do upload those vids to my raw channel but for me there's not a great deal i can say about it it's just pieces of masking tape that you're putting onto the panel you know and i, I do i get some comments like some guy recently it was yeah, one of my favorite comments lately is like, man, I've been masking like a jackass, you know, and, and you know, it was really great to see you do that. Like, it was, it was something like a, um, a fuel flap opening or something like that. He's like, man, I used to take forever on those things, but you just did it in like a minute or so. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say. If you want to see more of the masking stage, go over to my Gunman Raw channel. There's a link in the description and there'll also be one at the end screen of this video so yeah as i said before i got the plastic over the car and i haven't actually sliced it out yet but now i'm uh, going to get the wet on wet sealer down on the new panels so obviously gave it a bit of uh, prep so sanded it down with 320 grit i can't even remember if it was me or alan that prepped this door up but yeah it was one of us one of us too you know got the a team on the job again um, and then, you know, obviously hanged it up on the uh, door stand, which is yeah, a really handy thing to have around the workshop. Back in the day, we used to actually, like, spray the inside of the door separately from memory. Yeah, that's what we used to do, like, all bonnets and boot lids and that. That was my job as an apprentice. I'd, you know, pretty much every morning I'd spray the insides of all the panels. So it was actually a good way to sort of get me familiar um, with spraying and, you know, just even just having a gun in your hand and mixing colors up and stuff like that and just getting the hang of it so yeah it was all good and yeah these days the, the methods have changed yeah, a fair bit I should actually do a video on that just the way that the trade has changed in my career yeah one day one day so busy <laughs> either way I've got the FLG 5 1.4 mil uh, for the wet on wet this gun's a killer gun I tell you what um, just I, I love what it does with me and it, it it's got minimal overspray, even at two bar pressure, what you see me spraying here. And it's got a very high transfer efficiency. I think I've just spotted a bit of a hair, uh, maybe off the tack rag or something like that, on the corner of the panel. So I picked that out and continued on my way as I do. So yeah, the, the wet on wet primer here, I use Slow Hardener with now. Um, at the start, when I first started working here, I think I was using Fast Hardener in the wet on wet. And coming from Glazerit, this wet on wet, it's okay, but it's nowhere near as good as the Glazerit wet on wet. And like that Glazerit um, non-sanding primer wet on wet, would just, it'd go down like clear coat, it would flow out and it, yeah, it, it was just really nice to put your base coat over the top of. However, this stuff, it, yeah, if you don't get it on nice, it'll sort of, you'll lose a bit of life out of your, your final um, finish, it possibly pinch back and maybe even end up with a little bit of orange peel. But yeah, as I say, I do really struggle narrating the masking. So I've just sat here behind my computer on pause. And what am I gonna say for the rest of this video? I've got like three or four minutes to go and I am at a loss. So I'm gonna put some tunes on for the next couple of minutes and yeah, hang around and watch till the end if you like, or you can just go and watch one of my other videos or whatever you like to watch. Um, but yeah, I'll put some tunes on and do be sure to stay tuned for the second installment in this video series. I try to keep my videos below 30 minutes these days. That's why I did decide to break this one up into two. So next Friday, um, as of you viewing this video, will be part two. Um, if you're watching it after them, well, part two will be ready for you to watch now and you should go and watch that after this one.
So here's a little bit of a teaser of what to look forward to in the second installment. And until next time, get out there and paint some shit. Thanks for watching, and this has been another Gunman production. Goodbye.